Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this episode we're taking a look at how to understand literature more fully, um, specifically focusing on just one aspect of creating characters and that is the humours. Have you ever heard of the humours before? So without further ado, let's get stuck in shall we? Just to say before we start, if you've wondered where I've been for the past four months, in the last video before this one, um, I give a few minutes, a five minute update on what's been happening in my life and why I've vanished. So if you're curious, go and watch that. So let's get into this topic of the humours. Do you know what humours are? You may immediately think of the medieval humours linked to medieval medicine, so phlegm, bile, choler and sanguine, where you've got to have this balance of humours in your body, otherwise you get ill. That's not what we're talking about in literature. Humours in literature, as we're talking about, come from sort of Ben Jonson's time, so contemporary of Shakespeare, called the Comedy of Humours. It's, it's known as New Comedy. Now, before we build up exactly what a humour is, um, I'll just share with you the idea of New Comedy. So, in New Comedy, you have around the heroine or the hero, you have a clash of two aspects of societies, two groups. You have what's called the congenial group, and you have the obstructive group, or the obstructing group. The congenial, as the name gives away, they're happy, they're open, they're friendly, they're welcoming, they're tolerant. The obstructive group are those who are dogmatic, bombastic, fixed in their ways. Um, they hold to a particular standard which they absolutely think is right, and they are aligned against the progress of the hero or the heroine. Whereas the congenial group, they're the ones that are supportive of the hero and heroine. And to construct these groups, what you have are humours. And that is a character that is built solely around one attribute, one quality. Not a physical attribute, a quality. And what that does is it brings a particular disposition, a particular way of thinking into high relief. And this is fantastic for satire. You can, you can sort of satire, if you think of satire, you can think of it sort of being like a cartoon of real life, but it's not as primitive as a cartoon. So Swift and Fielding and Richardson, you know, these, these could write great satire. Now I'll give you an example of how they do this with the humours. Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice, she writes the character of Mrs. Bennet, so Elizabeth's mum. Now she's a hypochondriac and she's a pretty 2D character even though she's quite entertaining to read because her whole life is built around hypochondria. Whenever something goes wrong, what does she say? Oh, my nerves, my nerves, whatever is to become of us. Or Mr. Bennett, you have no consideration for my poor nerves. She always is giving in to that emotion. And when things go right, she's really off and away with the fairies, you know, thinking everything is wonderful. She is really committed to excessive emotion. And what that does for Austin is it helps her ridicule a particular aspect of her society, particularly the parental age, because they come from the late 18th century. And back in the 18th century, the Romantic period is at its height, Romanticism. And that caused people to give in to their emotions. The more you could express how you felt, the more sophisticated you were, to the point that people would, I'm talking like full grown men, bursting into tears at the sight of a forget-me-not okay, which is a bit excessive. So that was sentimentality or sensibility, and it's what's being critiqued in the book, Sense and Sensibility, okay. Now, that's brought about by having a humour, this one character who is built around a particular trait. Austin doesn't make all of her characters humours, um, but there is one writer who particul particularly uses humours better than anyone else, in my opinion, and that is Charles Dickens. So, for the majority of this video, we're going to be referring to Charles Dickens' characters because they, they are probably the best example of it. So let's just set up what happens when you're using humours as your main focus in a book. Based, I think we've just mentioned, we've got a congenial society, and we have an obstructing society in new comedy, which is where you use the comedy of humours. 
The congenial society supports the heroine or the hero. They are congenial, so they are welcoming, tolerant, open, happy, all that kind of stuff. Then you have the other aspect of the world, which is the obstructing society. So they block the heroine or the hero's progress. They block, if you can hear creaking by the way, old floorboards uh, in the house. So my wife's above me right now, I don't know what she's doing. Jumping on the bed perhaps. <laughs> We're all children at heart. Um, so the obstructing society, they don't want society to change, so they block anything which is out of the ordinary for them. And a new comedy always resolves in an improvement of society at the end. But, and it also involves the improvement of the heroine or the people whom the heroine interacts with. To get such a clash, the writers will often use humours to typify the certain positions of characters. And in the obstructing society, they are, they are very deliberate. So let's think of a couple of humours. If I were to say miser to you, who is a miser? If you were going to give a nickname to someone who was miserly, what would you call them? Think of Charles Dickens, think of Christmas. Scrooge. Scrooge is a humour. He's built around miserliness. Everything about him is miserly. Okay, until towards the end, we get a changing of the masks. Um, other characters, Miss Havisham in Great Expectations, there she is in her wedding dress, everything about her is frozen in time, she is epitomised around revenge and a clinging, sort of a harbouring of resentment is what she is, she cannot let go of things, so everything about her is built around that, and it actually makes for a very vivid character, it doesn't necessarily make for a rounded character, but vivid. They stand off the page to us and we can see what they stand for. And what's great about them is when you amplify a particular quality, it's why with Dickens, even though we sometimes call his characters grotesque or caricatures, I use those phrases but it's not exactly right, they are humours. It's why you read Dickens and you can immediately recognise someone you know as being that person just because they may have a disposition to a certain way of acting or seeing the world, and it's brought into high relief by Dickens. And he does that by removing the nuance of that character and focusing in on one particular aspect of them and sort of making them embody it in total. So um, other characters that you would have, um, Uriah Heep, Uriah Heep in David Copperfield, I'm ever so humble, this oily, snake-like, scheming, character in the background that is just faux humility and hypocrisy but he is obsequious isn't he yeah so obsequy is sort of what he is built around because it's obsequious in order to advance his own agenda do you see how he becomes this humor okay a style a feeling an emotion that is embodied that's focused on it it's almost an obsessional point of focus then you've got somebody like Paul Dombey so Paul Dombey is proud, right at the beginning of Dombey and Son, you see him sat there with his newborn child um, and he's saying Dombey and Son, rolling the words around because he loves his trade company that he's built, the name of his family, he thinks he's above everything. And of course this follows, you know, he is a very implacable, unbending character through the whole book. He's a humour. Speaking of Dombey and Son actually, some good characters in that, there is a character called Karka. Karka is a humour as well. He's sort of the real bad guy in the whole book because although he doesn't overtly do anything bad, you know he is a Machiavel. You know he is a schemer that is working for his own advance. And so these are all humours. A good humour would be Joe Gargery. Joe Gargery is, is built around kindness. So he always supports Pip. He never loses his temper, you know, he's good to his wife, Mrs. Joe, even though she's a complete tyrant. He's built around a particular humour. And so what that does is it allows us, when we're reading, to see the contrast of society. And ultimately, what's got to happen in a new comedy where humours are used is the hero or heroine will not be a humour. They have to be influenced by the things around them, so they have to be flexible. And 
you're going to see how they interact between the two societies. But the comedy itself will always resolve in an improvement of society. The obstructive society will always lose, so you always have a happy ending. Doesn't mean to say you can't have people die. You can have main characters die in a humour, but the overall effect is positive and it leads to an improvement of society as a whole and some kind of crumbling of the opposition. And this is something I might bring out about writing the new comedies and humour. It allows for sentimentalism. Um, when we think of Dickens, sometimes you can feel the emotion, the, the deliberate playing of emotion on the reader, trying to manipulate them, um, to the point of sometimes being a bit maudlin, you know, over, overly much. And I love Dickens, but I'm happy to say that about some of his work. So how do you actually create the humour? Well, we've said we focus on one aspect of the personality. So that's... That is really the central part. But what you have to do is you sort of have to put little flags up for the reader. And there's a, an aspect of creating humours which is called the tagged humour. So something is tagged onto them, which becomes symbolic of them, which causes the reader's mind to incline a certain way, to perceive everything a certain way. It's very clever, actually, how this is done. Now, the tag can be, it can be a, a characteristic, a, man, a mannerism, like grinding your hands together which would, you know, say a bit greedy or obsequious. Um, normally, though, you have the verbal tag. So it's something that a character keeps on saying. So whenever they turn up, they keep saying something. For instance, Joe Gargery. Ever the best of friends, Pip, ain't we? Ever the best of friends. So he repeats this a number of times when things get a bit thick, a bit, you know, dicey. It shows us that in his mind, he will never alter from a good standpoint. And it brings out this quality of goodness in such stark contrast to the other characters who are in Pip's life that cause him to move away from Joe. And of course, the whole book resolves itself in, in Pip understanding that a true gentleman, true nobility comes from within, not from the external. But there's that verbal lick that he uses. And he's not the only one. So um, John Jarndyce in Bleak House. Oh, it's, uh, it's, how are you, John? Oh, it's, the, the east wind is blowing. The east wind is blowing. The east wind always means um, an unfavourable wind. Things are bad. But he's not a critical character. He doesn't like things being disruptive. And so he, he has a, a phrase for them, sort of, he insinuates it. He doesn't want to be negative. So positivity is there, and he's got this sort of verbal lick. Now, you can also have physical characteristics or mannerisms which create the humours as well. Now, one of them, and I mentioned him earlier, is a good character. You do not like him at all. Never do. There's nothing to warm to him, but he is a good character, although he is two-dimensional, okay? He's not rounded, like a lot of Dickens' characters. And we're going to mention why Dickens does that. Some people think it's because he lacks ability to write. No, you've got to understand the humours, actually, to understand Dickens. So it's Carker. I've mentioned him before. So Carker is the main clerk for Paul Dombey, who owns this big mercantile empire. And all of the managing devolves upon him, and he is a strong character. He's hyper-intellectual, which is often you know, the best bad guys are really smart. You just feel dwarfed by their intellect and their presence. But every time he comes in, um, or our main character has to deal with him, or someone is dealing with him on behalf of the main character, remember, obstructing society congenial, they want to do something for the character, obstructors don't. Dickens always mentions Carker's teeth, regularly. And to the point that it actually becomes funny whenever he says it. And he's got some turns of phrase which also make the expression of the teeth. Now, Carker is not snarling at people, although you get the sense that he is. But he's always smiling. He has this complete composure of himself, even though inside you know he's hating the person. So he smiles. And Dickens always mentions the number of teeth Carker has. So he's one of those with a broad smile that you can see all the ivories. And what this does is it is a flag to tell us what Carker stands for. He is a threat. You know, teeth. You don't think of teeth as the most friendly things. It's carnivorous. It's snarling, growling, biting, vampiric. We, we, you know, we're not best friends with vampires. 
So when he brings teeth up all the time, he's flagging to us how to view Kaka. It's just a very clever touch. You have other characters who, you know, like Miss Havisham. Here's, here's the, the tag for her. There's two tags for her. Her environment is the tag. She never leaves Satis' house. She always wears the wedding dress. She only has one slipper on because when she was jilted at 9.20 in the morning of her wedding day, she was putting on her shoes, her slippers, and she had one on and not the other, and she freezes in time. The wedding cake on the table, the way it's all laid out for the banquet, is a frozen in time. This is the harboring of resentment. We're told that she's locked up here. She's wearing this worn out dress, which has gone yellow with age. Everything is yellowing because of the harboring of resentment. It's decaying the soul. Do you see how we're tagged? And she also says to Estella a number of times, make him love you. Let him fall in love with you, then break his heart, yeah? She's vengeful because of her resentment. Verbal tags. Um, another way you tag people, and to turn them into humours, remember with a specific point. Dickens wants to, and satirists in particular, they want to give you a character that is so clear, it's building the backdrop for you to clearly see the dilemmas of the character and for you to make a moral judgment on the scene. This is what the humours are so good for, a moral judgment. And what was Dickens more than anything else? He was social justice, wasn't he? He tried to change things in the world. So Oliver Twist, for instance, he wanted to improve things. He hated what was known as the poor laws. Um, and the poor laws were like, if you were poor, you had to go to the workhouse and work, but that mistreat, that made the poor even worse off than they were before. And, you know, he wrote a book to change that. So he wants to bring everything into stark relief to show Oliver Twist's plight, and then the changing of society, how it could be if you just let the, the congenial group take charge. And interestingly, Mr. Bumble, who is the beadle of the workhouse, a humour. You know, he, there he is, he's always sort of expansive in his, in his look, a bit rotund, and he's got this phrase that he keeps using, or at least it's a word he keeps using, wishes or vicious, the wishes poor. So this condescending um, view of the poor, this vehement dislike of them, yet he should be in their favour, trying to help. Do you see how he's been brought into stark relief? And one of the ways that Dickens will do this is he will, turn, and others, will turn a character almost into an inanimate object so that they become part of the framework, they become part of the scenery so that you can hold this up, the obstructive society, and, and juxtapose it to the congenial. Which one is better, everybody? This allows for great sentimentality. So turning people into inanimate objects. Carker, teeth. He turns them into a set of dentures, basically. So you've just got this, you don't really get a, a full idea of what Karka looks like. You imagine he's wearing black, um, being a clerk, that helps. But the only thing you see in your mind when you think Karka is his teeth. That's it. You're focused on it. It's like a close shot from the camera. And by turning him into something so inanimate, it's easier to fixate a quality on him. Um, other characters, we mentioned, you know... Um, Oh, we're talking about going into inanimate objects, aren't we? We'll move on. Wemmick. Wemmick in Great Expectations. You know, he's a lovely character, um, but he has a very rigid view. And the way that Dickens does that, obviously he, he paints a brilliant backstory. You know, Wemmick tries to turn his house into a sort of faux castle, even though it's a very small house, because that's what he wants. And he's always talking about portable furniture. Um, in other words, portable goods that you can sell if you need to. So that's his tag. He just wants financial security. He's not about being rich and then being content with those things. But he's frequently referred to in, in sort of aspects that link to the clerk position that he has. And post box. Like, he talks about Wemmick having a post box mouth, square mouth, okay? Um, he has no great charisma about him. And so by turning him into this feature, he's actually a pleasant character, but he's a very much a bit part player, but he's building the congenial society by just sticking him to the wall. And that's something that Pip can now interact with and move past. That helps us contradistinct between the two sides of the new comedy. And that's how the humours work. 
So when you're reading a book, if you come across somebody, a character that is particularly one, no, not one dimensional. Dickens does not write one dimensional characters. He writes two dimensional characters. Um, they've got color. They do move and exist, but sometimes they are deliberately written just to be not quite part of the scenery, but to help contrast. So if that's why you ever wonder why some of his characters seem unbelievable, there is an element of belief about them because you recognize that quality. But he's put them there deliberately because he wants to set the scene for you to make your judgment. Okay, so I think of Hard Times. If you've ever read Hard Times, it's one of the few uh, books that Dickens writes which is set outside of London. It's actually in a fictional city called Coke Town because he's having a go at the industrial mill towns of the north and the horrible things that the, the workers have to put up with. And Bounderby and Gradgrind, they're not one-dimensional characters. They move, exist, have a plot around them, but they are fixated on a particular way of seeing things. Um, and so Bounderby, for instance, is a utilitarian and everything has to be explained without emotion. OK, so a horse isn't some cute animal. It's one of the funniest openings is this little girl trying to define a horse in Bounderby's school. And he's like, no, it is a quadruped, blah, 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 this, that and the other. It doesn't sound like a horse at all. But he's been tagged there in his way of talking to make us see clearly this is utilitarianism. Look at the effect it has on just the joy of life and those beneath him, okay? Something Dickens does better than everyone else, in my opinion, with the exception of Balzac, is um, he can turn institutions into humours. He personifies an institution. Chancery Court in Bleak House becomes a character. You know, right at the beginning, in the first page, it talks about fog. 16 times fog is mentioned in the first page all linked to a journey towards Chancery Court. This fog is a tag for the place itself. It is enshrouded. A miasma comes up around it, a poisonous aura. And it's it sucks people dry of their belongings to the point that you have, if you've read the book, Crook has his, his sort of pawn shop right near Chancery Lane, where he sort of drags in all the goods that people have when they're on hard times and have to sell him. It's, it's no accident it's right next to Chancery Court because that's what they do. Whenever a case comes in, the lawyers bleed the defendant dry of their money. And so what Dickens is helping us with there by making the Chancery Court a humour itself, and that's quite a skill, is he's saying to people in society, is this right? What he actually does, people did hate the Chancery Court back then, he put, he managed to put it vividly before them, what they were thinking, and they could say, yes, that's it. And of course, his book, Bleak House, actually helps lead to reforms of the Chancery Court. So the humours are a phenomenal way of building an energetic momentum in your reader. So if you're a writer and you want to critique a part of society, consider making a character who embodies that one thing. Or the institution, instead of developing the institution with various parts and departments and everything, you know, a lot of different interests, focus it purely on one single negative or positive, and you will get people reading and thinking, oh, I'm supposed to feel this way about this institution or this person. And that's something to look out for in your own reading. So if you're ever reading a book and you come across someone who seems to be obsessively stuck around one characteristic, particularly if they're unchanging, put a line from their name when you first meet them into the margin and write, is this a humour? Through the rest of the book, if they're in a humour, they will not become the main player. They can be significantly influential on the heroine or the hero, but they're not the main player. Heroes and heroines are never humours but you could spot that. And if they never change through the book, this tells you something about the author. And it's where you may have heard the phrase an unreliable author or a, a not trustworthy author. There's this idea that authors should let you decide. But if you find a humor in a book, it gives you an inclination of what the author believes themselves, what they want you to think, the emotion they're trying to pull out of you. Just thinking at the minute in, my, in the Patreon group, we're, we're just finishing off E.M. Forster's A Room With A View, 
Um, we're not having discussions over it. We all read it individually, and I come on at the end and do a, a review of it. Um, but there's a character in there called Miss Bartlett, and she is so prim and proper, she knows all the forms of etiquette and outward show of the early 20th century high class. The irony being that she's not high class as stuff. Well, she sort of is, but she hasn't got much money. Um, but she is dogmatic in her way of seeing that the English way of doing things and the high society way of doing things is the best, and she can't bend from that. Now, Forster's put that in. This is not a book of humours. It is not a new comedy, necessarily. Um, it's modernist. Um, but he brings her in because it's so useful to typify the part of society he is ridiculing. He's satirising the rigid, rigid forms that are expected of people, which robs them of their joy. So I'm being told by Forster there, he's helping me with a character to emotionally connect with the problem in society. He's making something that's sort of ethereal, philosophical, and he's condensing it into something I can watch and behold and, and dislike and think, oh, they've got that wrong. And then when that's juxtaposed with the congenial characters, wow, yes, this is a much better way of doing things. Do you see how that works? Absolutely brilliant technique. It's been used, like I said, Ben, the Greeks did all this, but Ben Jonson, that time period of Shakespeare, literature went through a dramatic shift and new ideas based on the Greeks were formed and obviously the novel eventually becomes the dominant piece of literature that comes out of all of that. So those are the humours. A humour is a character that is built obsessively around one emotion or one quality of living. They have a tag. Look out for tags if they always, if the author always references something, I will say always, you know, regularly comes to reference something to them. Um, it might just be that they say random statements. Um, Mrs. Miss Bates in Emma from Jane Austen, pork mother, okay? That statement is, you know, she just makes a comment. She's always wittering about things. She's very nervous. She, she typifies a certain kind of character and it just gives a bit of, um, it brings a bit of realism into the world, but it's still comedic, you know? It contrasts as well the distinction between those who know how to behave and those who don't. So that's what the humours are for. And if you spot them, why is it important? Because it adds to your enjoyment of the flavour of a book. When you can go, oh, look at that. That's a humour. That's the author trying to tell me something. Um, do I agree with it? Am I supposed to have a, am I supposed to be making a moral distinction here? Um, do I agree with it? That allows you just to savour it, even if you don't want to agree. You've stepped off, in one of my old videos I talk about, most people when they read a book, they're like on a train journey and the, the scenery whizzes by and they say, oh, that's lovely. But when you can see things like this, you're stepping off the train. You're no longer seeing the vast panorama. You're looking up at a piece of the architecture, you know, a bit of carving on a church or on a building or something, as opposed to just the broad spectrum scene. So I hope you've enjoyed this video a bit more in depth. And um, yeah, tell me what you think in the comments below. And if you want to know where I've been, like I say, just watch my last video because I explain what's happened to me. And I'm really glad to be back. I will try and be regular as I can. Um, and now I get to say something I haven't said for a long time. Until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.